Hello, good morning. Are we are we actually live? Yes. Yes. Okay. I cannot. Um, okay. So we have forty-seven people in. This is uh, great. That's uh, that's uh, that's wonderful. Um, so good morning, everybody. My, my name is David Norris. I have the privilege of uh, sharing this uh, session on practicalities of open data. As you may have uh, guessed, we have had a few minor technical uh, hiccups, which means I'm, I'm going to uh, keep this introduction very short because we've got some great speakers. Um, feel free to answer, ask any questions you would like uh, in the Q&A box. Uh, any question is good. Uh, we welcome any discussion at all. Um, we've had to slightly change our program. So the first speaker today is going to be uh, Falk Lussebrink um, from Magdeburg. And he's going to tell us about an ultra high resolution in vivo MRI data set as a human phantom. Over to you. Thanks for the kind introduction. I try to share the slides now again. Here we go. Can you see? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so, uh, as David already said, so this will be about ultra high resolution in vivo MRI data set as a human phantom. And uh, to give you a short overview, um, we're going to talk about why we want to acquire ultra high resolution data at all. Uh, then we're going to look at the very first data set which we'd acquired. Um, I'm going to discuss whether it was worth the effort to put it together. And as a brief hint on what the questions or uh, what the answer may be, I'm going to talk about the extension to, the, uh, to what we call the human phantom. Um, so, why do you want to acquire ultra high resolution at all? Still currently, the neuroscientific resolution of our structural imaging is about uh, one millimeter isotropic for about 20 years now. However, on the other hand, the gold standard measure for pretty much anything else is histology, and that doesn't fit well together in terms of resolution. And especially also histology is quite invasive, while MRI is not so invasive at all. Um, so to bridge the gap, um, we want to do that by acquiring really nice high resolution data. Um, and this also can mean that we can better translate something to animal models, at least in terms of resolution, and um, even to, to histology, although histology resolution is still a bit far off. So to give you a hint at um, what higher resolution means to us, so in the top row you can see an MP rate with an acquisition uh, acquired resolution of one millimeter isotropic. Um, um, in the middle row it's 500 micron isotropic resolution, and in the bottom it's a 250 micron isotropic resolution. Can, can I just ask? For, um, is yeah, every, sure. every, at the moment, I'm seeing your last slide. Thank you for your attention. And it's not in display mode. I don't know if anybody else uh, um, is having this experience. Yes, yeah, it's the same for us. Unfortunately, we see your PowerPoint. Okay, yeah. sorry. Then let me just try to share the presentation again. On this one. So let me go back to the overview. <laughs> so uh, uh, yeah, that, that looks better. Okay. Yeah. That looks better. Very good. Yes. Well, it says why to share the, the presentation once you're in presentation mode for the others. Yeah. Uh, so just briefly, I'm going to talk about why we want to acquire the data. We're going to look at the first data set. I'm going to discuss whether it's worth the effort, and I'm going to talk about the extension to the human phantom. Um, as said, so the standard resolution of uh, neuroscientific studies is still one millimeter isotropic. And on the other hand, we have the histology, which is used as uh, the gold standard. Um, and we try now to bridge that gap by non-invasive measurement of MRI with ultra high resolution imaging, like you can see here with the 250 micron. Um, to give you a hint, as I said, uh, with what the resolution means to us, in the top row, you can see the one millimeter data of the same subject in the middle with a 500 micron isotropic resolution and in the bottom with 250 micron isotropic resolution. Um, and even by eye, you should be able to see that the basal ganglia or the cerebellum, for example, are pretty, pretty blurry in the uh, one millimeter data. Um, for the 500 micron, it's already very nicely depicted. 
However, if you have the comparison to the 250 micron data, you can even see uh, by eye or can think of seeing the folia in the cerebellum or the stria in uh, basal ganglia. Also, for example, in the hippocampal view, you can see a white matter band um, between the amygdala and the hippocampus, which is also present in the 500 micron data. However, in the one millimeter data, if you're, if you're not sure that it would be there, you would be able to see it, I guess. Also, for example, the Duba Mata uh, depicts really nicely in the 250 micron data, however, not in the 500 micron or one millimeter data. Um, so there's quite a few necessities to acquire such uh, high resolution data and uh, going from one millimeter to 250 micron uh, means that we have an increase in spatial resolution of uh, 64 times, so four times in each direction. And that also means that we have a decrease in signal to noise ratio by 64. If you would want to compensate for the exact same SNR, you would need to scan that very subject for 64 times uh, squared uh, amount of time. And that potentially is not applicable. Therefore, you have to think of other ways to increase your SNR. One thing is to go to uh, ultra high field and as high as possible, uh, because Poman et al. Um, identified that um, the SNR doesn't scale linearly, but by the power of 1.65 and going to higher resolution means that you will have a substantial SNR gain. Uh, then for that data set, which I showed you already, uh, we acquired a total of uh, eight subjects, uh, a total of eight volumes. And each of these volumes took an hour to acquire. So you will need to have a subject which is willing to be scanned for a couple of hours. In our case, we split the acquisition across many sessions and the time span of three months. Um, then, furthermore, in order to acquire data with that high resolution and, um, uh, and that long scan times, it's absolutely necessary to have a suitable motion correction setup. Uh, in Magdeburg, we use a prospective motion correction. That means that prior to each acquired case baseline, we update the field of view, and therefore uh, we can compensate at least for rigid motion of that subject during the scan. So we made quite a bunch of data publicly available, which we acquired in that way. So the scanner's raw data is available in the ISMM raw data format, which is about 1.2 terabyte in size, the reconstructed data and pre-processed data, each about six gigabyte. Uh, the average of all those eight uh, single volumes is about two gigabytes, and the motion data, in case you're interested from the tracking system, is about one gigabyte. Uh, alongside the data, we published uh, a data descriptor in Nature Scientific Data. Um, obviously, the data repository is available following that link uh, to our dry repository, and the raw data is available in our university's uh, data repository. Um, it was quite challenging for me, at least, uh, to, to format the data according to bits because I didn't have any experience before that. However, I guess it was quite worth uh, the effort because we uh, got quite a few inquiries for collaborations scientifically and artistically since we published the data in, uh, I think it was 2018. We have more than 60,000 downloads of that data from the Dryad repository. However, for two years now, or one and a half years, it's not tracked anymore, so numbers might be even higher currently. We got 77 citations. The article was tweeted or mentioned in 130 tweets, roughly, um, reaching up to 430,000 followers. It was picked up by news outlets, blog posts, YouTube videos, and even Wikipedia. And that's why we came to the conclusion, okay, we should extend that data set. And that's what we did. Uh, we were lucky enough that that same subject has been uh, in very many studies in Magdeburg. And um, to give you an overview of what we now call the human phantom, is we have uh, structural data with T1 weighted and T2 weighted acquisitions. We have DTI data, we have TOF, or we have QSM, and based on that QSM, uh, a venogram, and also some resting state data. And I'm going to show you the thingies now in, in detail. So we have uh, two times a TOF 
sequence with 250 micron isotropic and 150 micron isotropic resolution. And um, although the uh, increase in resolution doesn't seem to be that large, uh, within uh, well, coming from 250 micron to 150 micron, you can really see very tiny arteries within uh, within the brain. And to give you a bit more impression, we have a short animation here just running through uh, maximum intensity projections from, from quite a few views. Um, now going into a bit more sagittal view um, before we see a 3D visualization of the vessels, which are then overlaid on the structure. Um, beyond Petov, we also updated um, the 250 micron data because if you look on the light left, you could see that the image looks a bit blurry and we were not very satisfied with the blurriness of the data. Uh, therefore, we updated it by changing the interpolation methods of the registration method of all eight volumes. And also because then visually the SNR did decrease, uh, I also implemented a a possibility to denoise data during reconstruction. And by very slightly filtering, we came uh, to the updated figure on the right, which has similarly uh, high SNR, at least visually, but being a lot more sharper. And just recently, so I think it was a week ago, I uh, re-looked at uh, the reconstruction pipeline and changed some things about that one. And currently unpublished is uh, this beautiful data set, which pretty much is noise free. Um, however, still is much more sharper than the original version. And now what we were not able to see before is for example, the screen of Genari in the, um, in the occipital lobe is now visual, visually uh, or can be detected uh, just visually also. Um, then in the human phantom data set is QSM data as said, that is at an isotropic resolution of 330 micron. Um, and that allows us to, to have a bit more contrast than or additional contrast than to the T1 weighted image. And based on that, we build a venogram. On the left, you can see a run through the sagittal slices and on the right, a maximum intensity projection seeing very detailed the, the, the venous system of the brain. Um, then we have also a T2 weighted uh, space at 450 micron isotropic resolution. And here you can see it side by side to the T1 weighted image. Um, and as you already know, that adds a lot of um, com complementary information to the T1 weighted images. Furthermore, we have uh, DPI at 800 micron resolution, which uh, with a B value of 750 in 12 directions, which is not awfully a lot, but you can still do the um, standard trajectory of the white matter tracts. However, also due to the high resolution, you can uh, have a look at a tractography in the cortex. And uh, from anatomy, we know that um, the tracts have an L-curved shape coming from the white matter to the gray matter, and that is already depictable in our data set, for example. And then we have one hour continuous resting state fMRI data at 1.8 millimeter resolution without multiband um, covering the entire brain. And I'm not, I'm not proficient at resting state fMRI, but I was told that uh, the data looks quite nice and uh, that you can even do dynamic um, windowing of the data set and to have a look at uh, specific time frames of, of that data. Um, we all put it together by rigid registration with our human phantom and just uh, to, to show you a few nice zoom ins. So on the right, you have the T1 weighted data again on the bottom of the T2 weighted on the bottom left, the QSM uh, and the venogram on the left. And I just see there's a typing error. It should both be 330 micron and 250. At the top with 140 or 50 micron also um, of the basal ganglia area. However, there's more. So uh, the subject has been uh, within very many studies in, in Magdeburg. Uh, and there is um, about 100 AP rate sequences acquired in, a, in a 10 years, starting from 2009 to 2019. And if you would be interested, you could do quite a few numbers of longitudinal analysis. 
all of these data are yet again publicly available uh, in as open formats as possible. The, the imaging data is structured according to bits. Uh, the, the raw data of a very specific eight back-to-back -back scan is in Siemens raw data format because that can be used in the reconstruction pipeline I put together. This time we also included all sequence protocols and scripts uh, used to, to generate the data. Um, then the data descriptor is yet again available in another scientific data publication. The data repository is mirrored at our university at Open Euro, and the reconstruction pipeline used is available in my GitHub repository. So, um, and I want to conclude my talk with, uh, with an email that reached us in early 2020 from colleagues in Illinois, and they wrote the following. Uh, thanks for making your open source data 70 uh, publicly available. We used it to make arguments to bring 70, uh, 70 to our campus and we'll be getting a Terra in the fall. We printed out the 70 data as a wallpaper for our new MRI history museum. And that history museum uh, has the very first two MRI systems of Paul Lauterburg, which were built in 1975 and 1979. Thank you so much for that great resource. And I couldn't feel more honored that our data set hangs now in a, um, in a museum covering the uh, exhibitions of Nobel Prize winner Paul Lauterburg. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, funding agencies, my colleagues in Magdeburg, Leipzig, and uh, MGH. Thanks. So. Well, we we have a we have a question. I, I think from the co-moderator uh, Daniel, yeah. and uh, he's uh, he's asking uh, how many uh, downloaded. Um, yes, so the the downloads were tracked uh, at the beginning of the drive repository, but are not anymore since they changed the the website. Uh, since as long as I, I was able to, to find out the numbers, it was 60,000 times downloaded. Um, so in total, um, the average data set was on the order of 12,000 and all the other data sets accumulated there. So 12,000 probably, two years ago. <laughs> do, we have, do we have any more questions? I don't see a, a lot of uh, stuff coming in the Q&A. Um, do you think this is the, the future? Are we going to do studies like this? At what, at what level would it get? Uh, in, in, so, so the n equals one. And uh, what, what prospect do you see for n greater than one? Um, we are currently in the process. Well, we just also got to upgrade to our Terra system. And um, yeah. once everything is established, we're going to uh, do a Another study with a total of 10 subjects acquired at that resolution. First, the structural only. Uh, and first, we're going to try to, to build an atlas out of it. So any, uh, anyone interested in, in really high resolution, either for neuroanatomy, for teaching, something like that, I think that's a great resource to not just have it in drawings or uh, histology, but really MRI data at, at that high resolution. Right. And yeah, uh, this is probably not really a session about acquisition, but I can't quite restrain myself. Um, did you is the distortion along the read gradient matched for for all of these different uh, sequences, or is there some slight misregistration? Uh, so wherever applicable, we did a distortion correction for for the for the EPI based data acquisition. Mm -hmm. uh, so with a point spread function approach. And yeah. apart from that, we only uh, rigidly register data. Um, okay, but they they seem to match quite well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we shouldn't go into this probably in too much uh, detail either. Anyway, um, you can well, just ask me offline. <laughs> yeah, we could cover it. Well, uh, I, I I would love to, but I, I I've got to. Um, I, I think we should now find the last person or the next person standing from the other presenters, um, because um, my understanding was that uh, Jeanette had to talk as soon as possible. Um, because she has to go somewhere else. So without further ado, um, we move on to the Travelling Volunteer 4D Flow Project. So over to you, Jeanette. 
Yeah, at first, thanks really um, for having the chance to share with you some thoughts. And you know what I did in the beginning, or when I was asked for the traveling volunteers for day for D, I asked back if there is a chance just to talk about uh, quality assurance itself. And um, I was allowed, David, so I will do um, a little bit uh, going into that direction. And in the beginning, and just a disclaimer, I'm a cardiologist. So a lot of us expect uh, will just come from a clinical perspective and from that view what we really need. And that was the reason uh, brought us to the idea of the traveling volunteers. I'm sure a lot of you are doing that. But the background really was the following, you know, Probably some of you know um, that publication uh, from uh, Tim Leiner, and originally he is a Philips scanner. And what I only want to show, usually it should be animation. You could use a GE scanner, Siemens scanner, Philips scanner, whatever. At different points, all of us have the chance during the imaging chain uh, to implement artificial intelligence. So that is that what brings us forward, hopefully, um yes uh, really to good results to drive patients outcome but the issue is that at all of those points beginning from the question of course bringing it towards the reports we have a huge influence of our so-called quantification probably you uh, for sure you better than me know that uh, mr or mri just have not the chance to give a really quantification in the metrology sense but from the clinical perspective, we are just using it. And of course, usually we are um, we don't have a part really in the classical recourse instruction of images. Of course, we influence the image quality, but our the most important thing for us is, especially in cardiac MRI, uh, that we start to quantify, uh, for instance, the uh, chambers of the heart, to, to quantify the mass, to quantify the ejection fraction. And there we have a lot of confounders. And that is something uh, what really brought us toward the idea going into a quality assurance. Uh, what is that when I'm talking about confounders? Um, that can be just a reader, that can be a different software, that can just be the scanner itself, the sequence. And all of that, when you change that, will change just the number you get out of it. Our problem is, on the other hand, or the chance that in a lot of regions of the heart, we have to quantify it just to guide the patient. And that is always that what we want to do. Just, it's not only a buzzword to say, uh, we want to go towards personalized medicine, but that's just what we are able to do. When you think about a patient, of course, we have the huge chance to use 4D flow like shown here. And that's not about the colors of all of you know. What we want is that we get numbers out about um, different measures, velocity, wall stress, whatever. And it's about the valve here with the prosthesis opening and it's the function of the valve influencing, of course, the hemodynamics of um, the large vessels. On the other hand, what a heart is able to do, you see here just the function of the heart of the left ventricle, but you are also able to quantify the so-called myocardial uh, deformation using strain. Again, just numbers coming out. These are really just numbers and it's not true, it's not wrong, but we use that number to establish a cutoff and then to say it's just a pathology or it's just normal. Same is true for mapping. Mapping is a huge chance to quantify the myocardial injury, just um, to quantify the characteristics of the heart muscles. Is there too much water in? Is there too much fibrosis in? Is there a perfusion defect? Whatever, that is about the structure and all of that is playing together. And meanwhile, we were really successful using CMR. There are more than 30 guidelines and guidelines are something usually clinicians are using um, to run a therapy of the patients and more than 30 of them just now a cardiovascular MR is included. So we're extremely proud, of course, no doubt at all, but that's a huge responsibility. When we use that numbers worldwide in large hospitals and small hospitals, hopefully all over the world, and all of us are taking the same numbers and we have to know is, for instance, two really two, or is it in some centers more two or four? 
And that is that uh, what we are working on. And when we talk about um, uh, those guidelines, guidance for patients, and I really have to say, and I, uh, I really love 40 Flow, you have that different information. Sorry, it looks like that video here is not running. So we are able to uh, visualize velocities. We are able to quantify the so-called uh, wall shear stress or at least visualize it. There is a lot of information about energy loss. It's about visualization, but getting numbers of, of that. That 40 flow is not a part currently of any guideline. There's a lot of research ongoing and all of us have a lot to learn. On the other hand, again, it's a chance. But I, I, you know, I joined in 96, uh, the field of MR. And that time I really wanted to go into metabolism, spectroscopy, and that is still a dream uh, to do it in routine. And I really hope that will not be the case, a case in hemodynamics. So an ongoing uh, study we are running is to improve the understanding of patients with aortic stenosis, so a narrowing of the aortic valve. And here you see an example of just the flow in the aorta um, having here red colored um, aneurysm. So it's really an enlargement of the aorta and red is the wall shear stress. And we assume that not only the diameter of our aorta um, just give us the information if someone needs a new one or not, but also the wall stress. But we don't, again, we don't have a cutoff value. And we want, when we want to understand what is ongoing in a heart, we put all that together, what we are able to give to so cardiac function, flow, then we go into parametric mapping, just uh, to differentiate the myocardial tissue, fat, uh, 2D flow, all what we can get. But again, we get numbers out and try to bring that together. And we were a little bit afraid about including patients, different scanners, probably using a little bit different sequences. So what do we really have to learn? From a clinical perspective, the idea is straightforward. We just have the goal to understand pathologies better, to make better decisions. And already years ago, we compared just different software versions. That was about uh, Circle CVI, Argo, Siemens, and Metis. And in the beginning, I want to say it's not about being wrong and being right. It was just that one experienced reader uh, quantified uh, the mass, the function, the volumes of the left ventricle, and also parametric mapping. And it turned out when we compared it and we established so called tolerance ranges, that is the gray bar. Please keep just in mind that is a tolerance range. That tolerance range was quantified with the help of a statistician. And um, it is really hard because that was an intra reader, not inter reader, intra reader uh, just uh, deviation. And that is that what we said that is the best what you can get. And uh, when we had uh, defined those tolerance ranges, we compared the different software versions. And that was great to see that at least ejection fraction stayed within the tolerance range. Same was true for the ventricular mass, but it was different, for instance, with T1 time. So again, it's nothing about wrong and right. It's only about when you want to follow a patient, stay within one software and don't change it or probably understand the difference or just find a way to normalize it. So that was the influence of software. And we did that not only using parametric mapping in MRI. It's, um, yeah, it's not only in MRI, it's also in echocardiography or it came from echocardiography that we have a huge interest in the quantification of myocardial information. It's a post-processing that is feature tracking. And again, you just get numbers out of it. And we compared, again, different software versions here. In that case, that was TomTech and CVI. And we did not only compare the different software versions, and I don't want to bring you through all details. We also compared different kinds of analysis. So for instance, including all short access slices or only three of that. And what one has to say, um, when you use just the different ways to quantify a strain, longitudinal strain, circumferential strain, radial one, you just get significant differences. So here again, be careful when changing the approach uh, to quantify something on changing the software. 
And I guess the idea to ask me um, to have the chance to join your team was because we discussed in a meeting of our PhD fellows, our traveling volunteer study with 40 flow, but that has a certain history. Already uh, some years ago, we published a comparison for the flow between different field strengths. You see 1.5 Tesla, 3 Tesla, and we compared it, of course, to 7 Tesla. And it was not completely surprisingly that all the quantifications really exceeded the tolerance range. Remember that gray bar. And at first, and um, I really have the honor and the chance to work close together with different, not me, our group, with different scientists. And at first they were a bit frustrated because they said, no, the sequences are uh, really working well. And so they did. And the correlation, so just the usual correlation um, graph was amazing. That was really very, uh, very good. But nevertheless, when we really want to get numbers out of that, again, to guide our patients, then there are significant uh, differences. So that was true for different field strengths. But also, um, that was a comparison of GE, uh, Philips, and Siemens, three Tesla scanner. And here again, exceeding the tolerance range. What we did was not the way uh, here with the different vendors that um, we harmonized the sequences, to be honest. The reason was that you will never get it done. So you will never reach, to my opinion, the uh, ultimate um, goal that all of us worldwide are using completely the same parameters. So what we asked uh, the vendors and also the sites use the best what you are using in uh, your clinical routine or in your research. And there we have different numbers out of it. Never mind, remember our uh, plan study and there we decided that we want um, to include patients at different sites of the Charité. That is our university medicine in Berlin. And you have to drive, for instance, from the south to the north more than one hour by car. And we have established a research network there. So all the different research scanners were enabled um, uh, with the same setting of cardiovascular uh, sequences, including mapping, including um, 40 flow. That was the, uh, what you have seen uh, in the beginning. These were no clinical routine scanners. They were usually located just in a setting. And established a protocol. And before we started that, there we had our 20 healthy uh, volunteers, and all of them were scanned at uh, three, three Tesla scanners, all from Siemens. And we had also the goal to use the Philips scanner at the German Heart Institute. But then COVID came, and we were not allowed just to enter that. We compared all it to 1.5 Tesla. But that there is a difference, we are not astonished. And uh, our traveling volunteers experienced uh, different sequences, also, for instance, mapping. And just now, I will share with you preliminary results. That is just a first shot, and we have to go into that. So it was uh, T1 and T2 mapping, different scanners. And we were really happy to see um, that here, just um, the standard uh, MOLLE and the standard T2 date just within the tolerance range. But what we, yes, what we don't understand currently, and we are working on that also with the help of Christoph Kolbitsch and Sebastian Schmitter, um, you see that we have a bias here. And these are, again, different scanners. And um, we were extremely astonished to learn the uh, scanner at CBF in the, the South and at CCM, they were similar. And that at CCB is a Skyra fit, the others were Prisma fit. Never mind. Those ones, so Skyra fit and Prisma fit, um, just were really in the same range. And the other one was different. That was one software for the evaluation and one reader. So one has to say, okay, it seems to be comparable. It stays within the tolerance range, and you see that the differences are not so large. In T2 maps, our normal value is below 50 milliseconds. That was just a difference around 2 milliseconds and that it was working. Um, I'm sorry that these are so small points, 
these were 2D flow. I only want to show that it looks like when you compare it that there was a huge scatter, but here again, 2D flow. We were happy to see that just peak velocities that just date again within the tolerance range in all that 20 volunteers. 4D, and we measured it at different parts of the order. So you see here six different levels. And again, one can say when we compared it, it stayed within the tolerance range. But again, we had somehow um, differences between the scanner. It looks like a certain bias. And currently, we don't have an idea. What we just want to propose is that uh, one has to understand the influence of a Hemodynamic of a hemodynamic of a patient itself. Of course, also a traveling volunteer has just different hemodynamics from going from one scanner to the other. We have the uh, confounder of scanners, confounder reader that we have excluded, confounder uh, post processing post uh, software that we have excluded. And to get all that comparable, um, Thomas Hadler from our group. Um, wrote an automatic software that gives us a chance that we compare quantitative uh, results. He named it case comparison. So you can have different um, images, like for instance, left ventricle quantifying also the right ventricle, and you can compare um, the numbers they named it clinical uh, relevant numbers like the left ventricular function or right ventricular function that you see the differences. But we also used, of course, a dice metric in a quantitative way, in a um, visual way to understand the differences better. Here, differences of reader. So the reader can be a natural intelligence or artificial intelligence that helps us a lot to understand differences um, for instance, um, between different readers, but also within those traveling volunteers. And that is something what we are doing currently, like a kind of a quality assurance. And you remember that from the very beginning. And I really think that at all those different steps, one really has to introduce an imaging labs and on a different level and different ways, a quality assurance really uh, to get reliable results. So thanks a lot for following me. And if you have more interest in more details, please let me know. Also, just send an email. And I know um, a lot of information. But to be honest, I want to share much more information with you. Thanks a lot. Well, uh, I, I can't find the applause button on this uh, tool. But anyway, thank you very much for the um... Very nice uh, presentation. Um, <clears throat> so we have uh, some questions in the Q and A. Um, again, Daniel is very active uh, here. So, uh, what would be your uh, what would be your number one advice when setting up a study? Can you, can you read the? Probably don't, don't need me to read the question out for you. <clears throat> Yeah, um, that is really hard, of course. Um, it would be great, and that is always a funny answer, <laughs> as much as possible. <laughs> but but um, it's extremely hard to get it done. I, I can only um, tell you to get that 20 traveling volunteers was extremely hard. To be honest, my advice is to have at least when you established when you establish a scanner or when you approve your own numbers in mapping, for instance, have at least 10, but ask other sites having the same scanner, having the same software about their normal values. Usually we are a huge network and one is able to share with you just or to bring you in contact to, uh, to another site and then just see if you are just in the same range using probably also the tolerance ranges. That is something I'm really convinced that it makes a lot of sense. And when you stay in that range, I guess one can use it. And if not, one really have to start from the beginning. And when we established our really first normal values, to be honest, we had around 100 normals, but you never can do it, for instance, with contrast enhanced sequences. And, and 
building a 4D flow phantom and moving that around? Would, would that give you, I mean, because then you remove the, the in, in, inter-session variability in the same subject, right? Which is, I think is the you know, biggest statistical bugbear of your study. You are so right. And that is that also what we discussed in that meeting, that a 4D uh, flow phantom would be amazing. Currently, we don't have one. And the PTB, you know, I guess very good, Sebastian Schmitter, Tobias Schäfte. Um, <laughs> due to our results, we somehow decided um, we will create one and use it. We, mm -hmm. we have a 2D uh, uh, phantom at the time, and that we used. And um, there we did not have differences. So, uh, but only at one side, just to travel that phantom again, it's also a challenge. Yeah. By the way, that mapping, we have a phantom and we are uh, scanning that really once a month. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I also got one more question in the chat. Um, you have complete faith in the manufacturer on the same scanner, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, once I have seen in uh, Shengveng how scanners are built, so I would say there is no scanner exactly the same, <laughs> but <laughs> you are totally right. <laughs> At least, so for instance, a Prisma should be a Prisma, Prisma fit, a Prisma fit, and the sequence. So I would say that variation um, one is able to fix. That was the case with our traveling volunteers. Two of them were really the same. The third one was a bit different. It was Skyra fit and uh, Prisma fit. But interestingly, one of the Prisma fits and the Skyra fits were, had really very similar numbers. Um, but you know, when you try to reflect the real world, and you know, we have, for instance, one cut off for all the patients worldwide. And we will never have the same scanners worldwide at every site, hopefully, because otherwise I would assume the quality will go down. So we need uh, Siemens, Philips, and GE to be a little bit provocative. And so we have to understand the differences between the scanner. I don't know what you think. That is that what I think. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think the, the the problem would be that to reduce for the variation between scanners to the sort of level we would need would probably increase the price enormously because it would the tolerance in the manufacturing would uh, go down. Um, and uh, of course, the elephant in the room, as far as the gradients is concerned, is that different manufacturers cheat in different ways with the gradient, so you don't have a um, truly linear uh, gradient uh, of the same quality everywhere but okay that's a perhaps a different matter i'm talking in the hope of encouraging more more questions uh, from the q and a is there anybody else who has questions we seem, we seem to have a, a very large audience it's your chance to uh, get some information from jeanette silence yeah. silence in the chat okay um Jeanette, it was uh, great hearing you, and uh, thanks for mastering all the technical uh, challenges. And uh, well, um, thank you again. Um, and I, I guess we're, we're we're a bit ahead of schedule, actually. So uh, I, I was uh, anticipating a bit more sort of burning discussion here. But um, if we have no further questions, then I think we will go back to where we should have started. So um, I, I hope a, 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 well, say goodbye to uh, Jeanette and, and I hope Amy uh, is, is, is now uh, ready with her Big Mac. Hello, let's see, <laughs> fingers crossed. Okay, um, I'm gonna try sharing my screen. Which isn't work, oh yay. Okay, fantastic, cool. Uh, Hey message. So um, I'm hoping now you can see the presentation. Yes. Fabulous. Yay, I'm very pleased. Um, yes, thank you so much for having me here to speak today. Uh, my name is Amy Howard and I'm a postdoc from the University of Oxford. And today I'm going to be talking about a, a new open resource that I've been acquiring and curating over the past several years. And this is called the Big Mac Dataset. 
uh, linking microscopy-derived microstructure with MRI signals throughout the macaque brain. So let's get started. Um, our ability to characterize the connectome has been greatly advanced by the scientific community's access to big data, but there are of course multiple ways in which data can be big. Firstly, it can look across the population at, um, between subject variations, such as within the 1200 subjects scanned as part of the Human Connectome Project. Alternatively, big data can act to characterize a single brain in exquisite detail, a beautiful example being the Big Brain Project, where a single post-mortem brain uh, was sectioned with consecutive slices acquired um, with a uh, nissel or cell body stain, uh, after which they were able to reconstruct this beautiful 3D microscopy volume. Recent work by Autio in the macaque uh, devises an HCP style macaque protocol uh, for um, uh, which will both help uh, improve consistency in population based macaque studies, but also provide a crucial link to the human HCP data uh, for cross species comparisons. But to characterize a single macaque brain using both MRI and microscopy, we present the Big Macaque or Big Mac dataset. The Big Mac dataset includes in vivo MRI, post-mortem MRI, and multi-contrast microscopy acquired in a single whole macaque brain. The in vivo data was acquired across multiple scanning sessions. We have around 270 hours of post-mortem scanning data, well over a thousand hours of microscopy acquisition, resulting in around four terabytes of raw data. So let's unpack this a little. The in vivo MRI requires structural MRI, uh, task um, and resting state function MRI and a fusion MRI, uh, whilst the post-mortem protocol includes uh, structural T1 maps and an extensive diffusion protocol I'll come on to in a minute. Uh, having both in vivo and uh, post-mortem data within the same animal is really quite rare in these kind of data sets, and it provides us an fantastic opportunity to link our post-mortem results to in vivo data within the same brain. The diffusion MRI protocol uh, includes two spatial resolutions. So at 0.6 millimeters, we have B4000 data with 128 gradient directions. At one millimeter, we have B47 and 10,000 with up to 1,000 gradient directions in the outer two shells. The high spatial resolution data allows us to characterize fiber populations with fewer partial voluming effects whilst the one millimeter data allows us to obtain a uh, good SNR when we push to these higher B values. And furthermore, we can acquire a thousand gradient directions in a feasible scan time of around one week. Further at one millimeter, we have both linear and spherical tensor encoded data, which can support more advanced microstructural models. And of course, with high B value, we obtain very good diffusion contrast. So here I'm just showing uh, diffusion weighted images as we trace this spiral out on the Q space sphere. All of our data was acquired on a seven Tesla small animal scanner using a spin echo multi slice sequence with single line readout. So this protocol is beneficial because it has fairly few image artifacts, but it is fairly slow resulting in the 270 hours scanning time. So the idea of Big Mac is that we can compare our MRI data to microscopy data within the same animal that has both high specificity and uh, ultra high resolution. So what microscopy have we included? After scanning, the Big Mac brain was sectioned with consecutive slices assigned to one of six different microscopy contrasts. So we have polarized light imaging to visualize fiber orientations, gallia silver stain to visualize myelin, Pressile violet stain to visualize nissel or cell bodies. And then we currently have three unassigned sections which are stored for longevity and future staining. Each stain uh, of similar contrast is repeated every 350 microns and we have whole brain coverage. Here I'm just showing some example microscopy images, but of course we have these for you know, serial sections throughout the brain. Uh, on the left, I'm showing polarized light images uh, where PLI utilizes the biofringence of myelin uh, to estimate the primary fiber orientation within the microscopy pixel. And the color wheel here just shows the orientations within the 2D plane. This data was acquired with a resolution of four microns per pixel. Uh, in the middle and on the right, I'm showing the two different histological stains. Uh, so in the middle, we have myelin, which has been stained brown. Uh, on the right, we have the nissel or cell bodies, which have been stained purple. This data was acquired with an order of magnitude higher spatial resolution of uh, actually 0.25 microns per pixel, which allows us to visualize you know, single um, 
uh, myelinated fibers, particularly at the, in the uh, gray matter, and also uh, individual cell bodies throughout the brain. So once we've acquired our, da our data, I think a really important part of open data is being able to curate it. Um, so here we want to be able to present our data in a format that is going to be highly accessible to the community or end users. So here we wanted to ask, you know, who is our community? What are they familiar working with in terms of file types and tools they may have available? And what about our data requires domain specific expertise uh, that maybe we are best suited to working with? And how can we abstract most of that away from the end user so that they can do uh, meaningful research uh, without too many uh, difficulties. And so here we really had kind of three different things we had to do. So minimal pre-processing of the MRI. So this is, you know, um, any kind of distortion correction, registration, uh, extracting surfaces, fairly standard. So I'm not going to talk too much about that today. And instead, I'm going to focus on MRI microscopy co-registration and extracting quantitative microscopy metrics from the histological stains. So MRI microscopy co-registration is a highly difficult issue due to the large number of uh, degrees of freedom. Uh, but in Big Mac, the co-registration was achieved using TIL, which is Tensor Image Registration Library, which is some software uh, developed by Isfan Hazar, another member of our group. And TIL allows us to take any 2D microscopy section and register it into our 3D MRI volumes. So here I'm just showing an example output where on the top we have the native polarized light image. On the bottom, we have registered the structural MRI to the um, microscopy data. And here I've just used uh, green to show the white gray matter boundary and orange to show the tissue outline. Uh, and if we then overlay these onto the PLI image, you can see that we get excellent correspondence to the tissue boundaries, uh, giving us confidence in this uh, uh, co-registration. We can then, of course, co-register every single microscopy slice into the volume. So here I'm showing the output where um, just this anterior portion of the PLI images have been registered to the structural MRI. And uh, of course, you can see that, again, we get very good um, agreement of tissue boundaries. Uh, this is true both for the PLI, but we can then also perform similar registrations for the nissel stain on the top or the myelin stain on the bottom. We've also spent considerable uh, effort recently in extracting quantitative metrics from the histological stains because the histological stains uh, aren't fully quantitative in themselves due to variations in staining densities across the slides, which are non-biological. And so here um, we've performed stain segmentation. So this is where we segment positively stained pixels from unstained background. Uh, and on the top here, I'm showing example patch from the uh, less densely stained gray matter. And on the bottom, we have the white matter, where we've derived three data-driven thresholds, uh, which uh, relate to weakly, moderately, and strongly stained tissue. We can then perform stain segmentation from across the entire slide to extract these stained area fraction maps, uh, where here you can appreciate why we have different thresholds, because using the weak threshold, we can see how myelin is varying across the gray matter, whilst the strong threshold allows us to um, visualize uh, or quantify myelin variations across the densely stained white matter and also the subcortex. We can further perform a structure tensor analysis, which is a type of texture analysis to estimate the primary fiber orientation per microscopy pixel, where again, I've used the same color wheel as for PLI. Uh, we can perform this both on the myelin stain slides, but also interestingly on the nissel stain slides due to the fact that the cell bodies tend to align with the fiber orientations, both within the white and to a large extent, the gray matter. If we compare the structure tensor output to polarized light imaging data from uh, an adjacent slide, we can see that we get very good agreement uh, of the fiber orientations where these two modalities uh, corroborate one another nicely um, and give us confidence in these different microscopy outputs. With the histology stains, we can, um, sorry, the, the nissel stain histology, we can again perform stain segmentation, but here we can go further and we can actually perform cell segmentation to try and uh, segment individual cells to the best of our ability. And this allows us to extract additional morphological metrics, uh, such as uh, cell area, uh, circularity, the number of cells within a given region, uh, the approximate cell radius, um, or the nearest neighbor distance, for example. And so you can see here that we're really able to build up this kind of 
a bank of different quantitative microscopy metrics that allow us to describe the tissue microstructure. Uh, we can then use this kind of data to quantify uh, cellular variations uh, across different brain regions. So here I'm showing the approximate cell body radius um, uh, within the white matter, the temporal cortex and the motor cortex, where we can observe uh, the small uh, glial cells in the white matter, and even these um, uh, low number of large uh, BET cells within the motor cortex, again, giving us confidence that um, these outputs are following on your anatomical expectations. Furthermore, we can then take these uh, microscopy sections and we can reconstruct them into our MRI volume. So here, this is very much ongoing work, so I haven't processed all of the slides yet, but um, as you can appreciate from this subset of the number of slides, uh, we can start to fill in this full uh, MRI volume using our uh, microscopy metrics, where then for each uh, MRI slice, we don't have a single microscopy metric uh, that we can relate to the MRI, but we have uh, orientation information, both from the PLI and the structure tensor analysis. We have stained air refraction maps telling us about myelin and cell density as well as all of these different morphological metrics that I described previously. Once we have our uh, microscopy and MRI data within uh, the same uh, volumes or the same space, we can then perform uh, MRI microscopy comparisons. So for example, we can do voxel-wise correlations. Uh, so on the left here, I'm showing the, uh, the numbers represent the correlation coefficient between uh, various different microscopy metrics and a whole host of diffusion MRI metrics that we were able to extract from our rich diffusion data in Big Mac. And on the right here, I'm just showing one of those correlations where we see a fairly strong correlation between the DTI mean diffusivity and the nearest neighbor distance uh, extracted from the Nissel stain histology, uh, where each um, data point here represents uh, the signal from a single voxel within the brain. We're not restricted to voxel-wise comparisons. We can also, uh, because we have surfaces within Big Mac, we can do cortical profile extraction. So this is where we um, have a series of surfaces uh, going across the uh, different layers of the cortex uh, that have matched vertices. And this allows us to extract a cortical profile, which is a 1D line profile uh, describing how um, metrics are changing from the white gray matter surface to the peel surface. And so this allows us to map how microscopy and MRI metrics um, are varying across different cortical layers. And finally, we haven't quite got around to this yet, but um, there's great opportunities for surface-based analyses. So we're all very familiar with these kind of myelin maps that have been previously extracted from MRI, where we can see uh, um, high quantities of myelin in the uh, uh, motor sensory cortex and also the occipital lobe. Uh, but of course, with our Big Mac data, we can extract similar um, surfaces from both MRI and the various microscopy metrics that can then facilitate, you know, a whole host of um, surface based analyses. So I think data curation is a really important part um, uh, of, of kind of sharing data if you have the facilities for it. Um, through this data cur cur curation, we're able to extract quantitative microscopy metrics. Um, we were able to simplify the file types, so the histology uh, files um, come in a vendor-specific format. They're very, very high resolution. Uh, a single slice can be up to 10 gigabytes um, of data. Um, but by doing some of the heavy lifting to extract these quantitative metrics, we can then downsample the data in sensible ways, meaning that we can then provide it to the end users in either TIFF, or nifty or gifty formats, uh, which are much more accessible. By doing sensible downsampling, we can also then reduce the memory requirements, which is good for data sharing. Uh, and also we can um, map all of our data into spaces from which the, um, uh, the MRI and microscopy can be meaningfully compared. Excellent, so the final part of my talk is just going to focus on data dissemination. Uh, so how are we sharing our data and really our thoughts here were that we wanted to minimize barriers to access, but we also need to be able to do it in a uh, ethical and responsible way. So the Big Mac data set is shared uh, through our online portal, which is called the Windage Tool Brain Bank. 
Uh, and this is where we ho host a whole series of different uh, post-mortem data sets that have been acquired by our group over the past 10 years or so. So in the Digital Anatomist, you'll find Big Mac as well as some other resources. Digital Brain Zoo has um, data from lots of different uh, animals uh, for comparative neuroanatomy. And in the Digital Pathologist, we have um, uh, both pathological and control data from post-mortem human brains for neuropathological investigations. Our uh, platform allows you to both uh, view and download the data. So here I'm just showing an example of our online uh, viewer, which uh, allows you to, you know, um, have a look at some of the um, microscopy images. Uh, uh, so which is, I think, a really good resource because these, as I said, some of these data are very um, large to download. And so this allows you to have a look at what the data is like, the quality of the data prior to download. And here we're just showing the um, uh, co-registered MRI, which can then also be overlaid. Some of our data is available um, directly online. So here I'm showing an example of one of the highest uh, uh, resolution diffusion MRI uh, whole brain human scans to date, uh, which is directly available as a file that you can access online. However, quite a lot of our data is actually, um, we ask people to sign a data sharing agreement uh, to access the data. So here we don't want to restrict people's access to the data. We're very happy for people to use it but it does need to be used in line with um, our funders and ethics requirements, which are, for example, that the data is going to be used for scientific research. Um, and it just allows us to keep track of who's using the data and, and do this kind of data sharing in a responsible manner. Furthermore, in the Big Mac data set, um, I've included uh, a nice read the docs uh, with online documentation. So here you can go and you can see um, example screenshots of all of the data that you can request. Uh, there's further information about our protocols and how the data was acquired. Uh, and uh, furthermore, we provide tutorials. Uh, for example, here's a tutorial about how you would use our tool warp fields. Uh, so this is really just to help people get started with the data so they can perform their own analyses. And of course, we're always on hand if there are any further questions. So uh, with that, I would like to conclude uh, today. I've presented the Big Mac dataset, which is a new open resource combining in vivo MRI, extensive post-mortem MRI, and multi-contrast microscopy in a single whole macaque brain. Uh, we hope this data complements uh, existing open, uh, other open data sets to provide a platform from which we can interconnect microstructural features with MRI signals throughout the brain. But we believe there are lots of applications to this kind of whole brain multi-contrast data from neuroanatomical investigations based on the ultra high resolution microscopy, uh, multi-scale neuroscience combining MRI microscopy, which are, have a, um, a three orders of magnitude difference in spatial resolution. Our fairly comprehensive sampling of the MRI space allows for investigations of MRI methodology or diffusion model validation. And furthermore, by having both modalities within the same space, we can facilitate many machine learning and data fusion uh, types of approaches. I think it's very easy in these kind of talks uh, for them to be presented as though it's this beautiful straight road into a gorgeous sunset, whereas in fact, uh, it's been a, you know, a journey with lots of twists and terms, turns uh, that we've had to navigate along the, the way. Uh, but I would argue still a pretty, uh, a pretty beautiful um, outlook. And when I was putting this talk together, I tried to think back of what I'd say to myself at the start of this kind of long data acquisition process. And I think my main message would be don't panic. Um, things don't always go as planned. Uh, that's life and that's OK. Um, utilize the expertise around you. This work has taken a whole host of uh, expertise from people who are experts in in vivo scanning, post-mortem data, tissue sectioning, uh, neuroanatomy, histopathologists, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I'm incredibly grateful to their contributions. Uh, one thing that's been really key for me is understanding each process of the data acquisition. So even though I wasn't the person who was um, doing the tissue sectioning, uh, if you're doing something like this, I'd really recommend going and sitting with the people who are doing the data acquisition so that you can understand each part of the acquisition process. And this can really help you troubleshoot difficulties in your data further on. Be patient, both with those around you, but also with yourself. Um, 
and my final comment would be that sharing data is always valuable. Um, only more recently has our group really had the facilities to be able to create, you know, this fairly fancy online platform with a viewer. Um, even if you don't have facilities like that, uh, you never know who your data is going to be useful to. Um, different groups have uh, the facilities to acquire different data. Um, maybe there's something special about your data. Um, we've had lots of people request data from us. Uh, even before we had the fancy online platform um, and we were using a much more simplified format. So yeah, please um, do consider sharing your data because it can be very valuable to others. And with that, I would just like to thank all those who've been involved with the project. Um, uh, you're welcome to look at our um, preprint and thank you very much for listening. Yeah, thanks very much. Um... So we, we already have a, a question coming from one of the other speakers, actually, Amy, so I'll, I'll, I'll pop it up on the screen for you. Uh, so is the algorithm for, for registration uh, MR to histology also publicly available? Yes, uh, TIL is publicly available uh, and it's actually released as part of FSL. So it's um, one of our tools. Um, if you just Google FSL Wiki or uh, TIL University of Oxford, you'll be able to find it online. Um, it's a very kind of modular software so that it is able to work in lots of different situations. That does mean that often you have to write a config file for exactly whatever your situation is. So if you're using block face images or not. Um, so there can be a little bit of heavy lifting at the start to get your config file right. But once you've done that, you can then roll it out over every um, slice. And it, yeah, we, we're incredibly happy with the results. Okay, thank you uh, for that. We we have a we have another one. Uh, uh, ah, well, a very uh, interesting psychological uh, uh, question. Uh, <laughs> Being patient. Um, yeah, it, I mean, it kind of made me laugh when I wrote this on the thing because I'm not sure that I would describe myself as a very patient person. Um, yeah, I think it's just. Uh, not stressing too much when things go wrong, like things always go wrong. Um, Data is not perfect, but that doesn't mean that it's not valuable. Like I think that the more that people are willing to share data and um, uh, the amalgamation of open data that we can get, like that's always going to be beneficial to the society. Um, and just, you know, being able to let things go every now and again when it doesn't quite work perfectly. Um, yeah, I mean, if I, I, we have plans to do a second Big Mac, and I think that there are definitely things that we would change. Um, but I also see great value in the data that we have acquired. So, um, yeah, very pleased. Yeah, maybe it's just uh, accepting you you are impatient, actually. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Coming to terms with it. Okay. Well, um, we we still have uh, you. You've got a right. You're not off the hook yet. Uh, cool. So how do you deal with the higher spatial resolution of the microscopy data when linking it to the different spatial resolution of the MRI? Yes. So um, there are like different ways in which you can do that. Um, my approach is that um, so what TURL allows us to do is that we can map every single MRI pixel to a microscopy volume, uh, like microscopy voxel. And so what I like to do is um, uh, I can get that mapping. I know I can loop over for every voxel. I know which microscopy pixels I should include across the entire volume. And then depending on what metric you're using, you want to take, I don't know, the mean value or some other kind of sensible metric. And that really depends a bit on, on what metric you're using, right? If you're counting cells or if you're looking at the mean density or um, for example, you can do clever things like taking the radius that you've estimated from the microscopy and turning that into a approximate volume fraction, uh, which may be more suitable to relate to the MRI. So you've got to think about, yeah, what's the MRI that you want and what's the my, like what's what, what's the comparison that you want to do? Um, but yeah, I recommend like the, my approach is to um, yeah, not down sample the microscopy data before you do the mapping to the MRI, because then you're going to get lots of interpolation effects. Instead, the TIL framework allows us to just say, OK, all of these pixels are included within my MRI voxel, and then you can do that kind of mapping. Um, 
do you lose this logical information on the road when linking different spatial resolutions? You don't have to. So, um, for example, you can, um, I mean, you can take the mean value, but you can also quantify, uh, I think I showed the, the axon radius, which was a distribution within a local area. You can have that full distribution where we've counted every single cell within a voxel. So you can start comparing a distribution which represents every cell. Um, for example, the if you want to compare fiber orientations, you can extract the fiber orientation from each pixel and then combine it into something called the fiber orientation distribution, which is basically a frequency histogram of all of your fiber orientations. Uh, and then you can directly compare that with an equivalent that you can extract from a diffusion MRI model. Um, so there are, if you just want to take the mean, I don't know, stained area fraction, then yes, you're now you don't have pixel wise information, but you can do other things where you can retain information about every cell or even pixel wise information. Okay. Um, I, actually, I, 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 being a, much more an experimentalist myself, I wanted to ask you some of those diffusion acquisition times were incredibly long. How did you guarantee the temperature stability? Yes, it's hard, <laughs> is the answer. Um, so we did get a little bit of signal drift due to temperature instabilities, um, but that was minimized um, by we had very long warm up periods. So every time we changed B value, we had, I think, four hours where we did, we just threw the data away um to try it. yeah <laughs> i mean when you're scanning for a week four hours to throw away data is not yeah, sure. yeah um but that's just to get the the temperature to then be fairly stable um and we also do control the temperature within the bore by um i think we um have like cold air flowing through it um and they've done previous experiments to try and show that the temperature is fairly stable with that method over a long period of time Yes, we did get some signal drift because we were doing it for a week um, and we did some corrections for that. So we just fitted to it and then tried to correct the uh, data. Right. And I suppose, you know, reusing the same question is always very economical. So I'll put the same question to you I put to Falk. Um, this is a great N equals one data set. Do you see um, what do you see potential in, in uh, scientific potential in and greater than one, and how would that start to, to, to look? Yeah, 100%. Um, so we have some plans to do a Big Mac 2. Um, the main thing with these kind of multimodal data sets is that the microscopy takes a phenomenal amount longer time than the MRI. So you want to acquire all the MRI you possibly may ever want before you um, depart on the microscopy acquisition. Um, so we have some plans for the scanning um, and then we we will do some further microscopy acquisition. We also do have other macaque brains from the um, Oxford that have less um, uh, microscopy staining, but they do have some stains. So mm. at least within certain slices, we can start to look at what's the um, between subject variability within the tissue microstructure, which within a macaque should be much hopefully less than in than in a human because there's much less variation in the cortical folding and if you can kind of quantify what that variation is and demonstrate that in some regions it's quite low that mm -hmm. then allows you to uh, utilize the microscopy from a single animal with more confidence when comparing it to MRI data from other animals that don't have the microscopy obviously it's not as good as having both data sets within the same brain but at least by quantifying the variability, uh, it allows us to kind of do those kind of comparisons with increased confidence. Yeah, um, and, and again, uh, being a bit the devil's advocate, I, I'm not sure MRI is always the leading modality in uh, outside of human imaging. Um, and, uh, I mean, people put a lot of effort in, into to doing invasive electrophysiology. Um, wouldn't it be a better modality to link up with the sort of post? So you would do the all those complicated experiments multiple times with the invasive electrophysiology, you know, depth-dependent electrodes, 
and then do all the post-mortem and the MRI stuff on them, would, would, wouldn't that give you more insight into the structure function relationship? I mean, those are incredibly large data sets as well, right? If we're thinking about yeah. Frankfurt and, and, well, you've got a lot of electrophys in, in, in Oxford as well, right? Yeah, I think I think that's a really interesting point. Um, I think the MRI hopefully allows us to try and map between animals where different things have occurred. Um, mm. Uh, so if we, I mean, if we can somehow m match up with that, those kind of data, that would be phenomenal. Um, I don't think we have any plans to do electrophysiology on the second macaque brain. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, 100%. I think if we can use MRI as, as a, a mapping between the different macaque mm -hmm. fields, that would be fantastic. And I think yeah. here as well, like I'm interested in not only the macaque work, but what can we, I like, I'm a physicist, so what can we mm. fundamentally learn about the microstructural underpinnings of the MRI and mm. can that eventually be translated in vivo into humans? So mm. uh, we also have post-mortem human data to try and see how well we can do those kind of mappings also across yeah. species, but yeah, 100%, anything, you know, tracer data from macaques, phenomenal. Like if mm. we can try and link up our, we have, whole brain microscopy data but it's obviously not quite the same as tracer data so anything we can try and link up will be excellent no because there was that coco map database years yeah. ago right which was more about tracing um yeah okay i actually i shouldn't talk so much because i'm here to encourage other people to ask questions so um uh, this this popped up we may have kind of diagonally hit this one quantitative mri um depends a bit more what, what you mean by quantitative MRI but uh yes we have some plans for uh hopefully relaxometry uh, and diffusion data um we're going to do a lot of scanning if people have ideas of what data they want us to acquire we're always open to suggestions because obviously this data is to be open and to be used by the community so um yeah if there's any burning data that you would like to see before we section it please let us know Okay, well, I will click on the done answering for that, which uh, I think means we've we've probably been interrogating you for long enough, Amy. <laughs> uh, thank, you, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Really very impressive. Um, and we now give the only talk in the session, which is going to be at the right uh, time. Uh, and we stay in Oxford. Um, but now it's uh, forget me not high resolution neonatal DMRI data with uh, Luke Baxter. So over to you, Luke. very much. So are you able to see my slides in presenter mode? No, yes, yes. Great. So yes, uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to present to you on this uh, study that we uh, carried out not too long ago. Um, my name is Luke Baxter. I'm a researcher in the Department of Pediatrics in the University of Oxford. Today I'd like to talk to you about some of the many um, challenging practicalities of carrying out the forget-me-not study which is a high resolution diffusion imaging um, study in unfixed post-mortem neonatal brain so a brief outline of the talk i'll just very quickly um, highlight some of the main uh, interpretability challenges for neonatal mri in general and then on to the forget-me-not study i'll focus primarily on the, the care pathway as this was uh, involved some of the most challenging aspects to um, carrying out uh, post-mortem uh, MRI for research purposes. Um, I'll briefly highlight some of the MRI acquisition protocol uh, components and if we have time on to initial results and some data sharing considerations. So as I imagine most people are aware, uh, the human connectome, the original human connectome project um, commenced back in 2009 and studied uh, young adults between the ages of 21 to 35. Uh, since then, um, uh, spring uh, other components of the Human Connectome Project have uh, extended the age range that's been studied into older populations as well as younger populations. And the Forget Me Not study is a, a sub-study of the Developing Human Connectome Project. So this is at the youngest um, age bracket. So the Developing Human Connectome Project uh, focuses on infants aged 20 weeks post-conceptional age or post-menstrual age up to 44 weeks. 
So this is neonatal and uh, prenatal age, age group. Um, the Developing Human Connectome Project is an ERC-funded collaboration between uh, three universities. You've got the King's College London, Imperial College and University of Oxford. One of their core uh, goals is to create a dynamic map of the human brain connectivity over the uh, specified age range. And as of uh, June 21, the third data release has been um, released uh, for public use and it involves, uh, includes over 800 um, neonatal data sets. <clears throat> so since um, the uh, release of these data sets, some um, very stunning images of group average tractography results have been produced. So these are from one of the DHEP's um, pipeline and analysis outputs, these images here, which have been averaged across uh, 20 infants for each of the age bins between 38 weeks and 44 weeks. And from research like this, we have been able to deduce kind of the um, approximate age of appearance of some of the major white matter bundles uh, throughout the developmental process. And the kind of uh, currently most accepted uh, kind of sequence of appearance of these bundles is presented here at the bottom. Um, but a lot of these rely, uh, uh, pretty much all of these sequences rely on diffusion data, which has some severe limitations, especially in the neonatal population, primarily for reasons of motion. So we've got at the top a recent scan that we carried out in Oxford. It's not diffusion scan, it's a bold scan, but I sped it up just to show kind of the degree of head motion that is pretty typical. This is by no means one of the worst subjects that we've had. This is pretty standard. And below is an example of the kind of um, artifacts that we see in some of the diffusion data. So we have with, between volume motion as well as within volume motion, signal dropouts and spin history effects. And while there are very sophisticated pre-processing pipelines for dealing with these kinds of artifacts, um, there's always the underlying uh, risk that either there are false positives or false negatives in what you're seeing and it could be driven by um, motion underlying uh, effects. Another major problem is the spatial resolution. So on the left, we've got, at the top, we've got a neonatal T2, uh, that's a 40 week infant's brain. I've put that next to the adult T1 to get a size comparison. So if we have one millimeter voxels in the adult, um, that has a, a, a lot smaller effective spatial resolution in the neonates. And then when we get into the neonatal population itself, there's a, a large degree of heterogeneity from week to week. So we don't actually use a single standard brain template, we have one per week. So uh, the kind of if on, uh, on loop at the bottom is kind of cycling through all the different uh, templates that we use. Uh, so there's a massive amount of size and shape variation, even within that narrow age range. Um, so to potentially address some of these problems, we have turned to uh, looking at post-mortem imaging. So this here enters the forget-me-not study. And the primary aim of is to provide high resolution diffusion MRI data for connectivity and microstructural estimates in the postmortem infant. Some of the kind of primary goals would be to better understand the developing of the, ma the mature human brain in this earliest in early life. Uh, validation of the DHB in vivo DMRI outputs, see if we can um, see the same kinds of tracts appearing. Uh, and improved interpretability of also of ultrasound, clinical ultrasound images that were acquired in these infants prior to their death um, and facilitating a bridge between histology and MRI. So this was a feasibility study and this is currently N of uh, one results that I will show. And the primary um, set of challenges was around setting up this effective care pathway. So I'd like to kind of walk through the steps of this and also kind of highlight some of the major challenges that um, had to be addressed. One of the key ones was participant eligibility. So eligibility, eligible participants were kind of identified by an independent clinical team that were caring for the baby or the mother. This was not something that was identified by the research team. So any judgment um, about the appropriateness of approaching uh, participants for the study was done by the clinical team. The potential participants were not identified to the research team until the clinical team were comfortable that the baby was 
eligible and that the parents were uh, suitable to be approached for the study. Then after identifying um, eligible participants, uh, the next major challenge was how do you go about um, approaching the parents and recruiting them for a research study under very difficult circumstances. The parents of all infants who die on the neonatal unit are offered the option of post-mortem examination, and this is a standard part of clinical care. So while the clinical team are um, discussing, um, having these discussions with the parents about post-mortem, the clinical team would ask the parents if they would like to hear about post-mortem imaging uh, options for research purposes. Then if the parents uh, agreed, the clinical researcher um, was then approach, would then approach the parents to provide information about the study to hand over a patient information leaflet to answer any um, questions that the parents may have. The clinical researcher then would leave uh, the parents uh, with as much time as possible uh, and appropriate before uh, re-approaching to further discuss the study, answer any additional questions parents may have and take informed consent. So in terms of um, eligibility criteria, we had a 48 hour um, cutoff period beyond which uh, we deemed it was inappropriate to um, include a, a, a long uh, MRI uh, scan for research purposes. And of course, the clinical researcher on the team who was uh, describing and recruiting, describing the study and recruiting the parents uh, was highly competent in neonatal care, had experience of handling these uh, difficult bereavement situations and was intimately familiar with um, the uh, the kind of uh, care pathway for those children to those babies to date. During the recruitment period, uh, there were eight infants that were identified as eligible. Uh, the parents of two infants uh, declined to participate. Um, four uh, eligible infants were not scanned due to either technical difficulties in setting up all of the um, kind of scanning acquisition uh, things, which I'll get onto momentarily. Um, but also a lot of the practical challenges in coordinating people. So if um, it's potentially obvious if a, an infant is not going to uh, survive, um, you might have uh, quite a bit of time to get everything in place. Whereas if it's a bit more um, uh, unpredictable, then getting everyone uh, in, in where they need to be and um, you know communication between the research team, the clinical team, the mortuary um, at last minute can be quite difficult. So there's a, a loss of um, eligible participants at this at this point. Um, but of these eight, two infants were recruited and scanned. Um, so the next situation that we had to deal with is post-mortem care and transport. If a, if a parent was willing to take part in the study, how do you actually transport, transport the baby from the neonatal bereavement care unit to the uh, scanning suite? <coughs> So the baby was transferred according to hospital regulations. Again, we were trying to minimize the impact of inserting a, a, a research component on top of um, kind of normal uh, standard practice. So we tried to follow the hospital regulations as closely as possible, but um, there are some things that were had to be adapted. For instance, uh, deceased babies are usually transported to the mortuary by porters using uh, metal containers. Uh, however, uh, we used a pram in the study as parents were offered the option to accompany their baby during transport to the scanning suite. So the pram was considered much more dignified and less upsetting when parents were accompanying, um, accompanying us. However, that using a pram raises a host of other problems as you uh, move through the hospital. So the baby had to be you know, completely covered over so that the contents of the pram could not be seen by passers-by. The last thing you need is somebody um, peeking in or asking uh, questions. Then once successfully transporting the baby to the MRI suite, the parents have their um, chance to say their final goodbyes and they leave as the imaging begins. The next, uh, so the next component of the study was the actual imaging acquisition, which I'll get onto in, in further detail uh, in, a, in a moment. And then after the scan, the infant uh, has to be transported to the mortuary. Um, so we carried out multiple dry runs to get every aspect of the kind of complex care pathway 
um, down uh, as as a as clear and as dignified and appropriate as possible. Uh, so we transported during the dry run our test uh, dummy to the mortuary using the same pram. It's at this point we realised that this was um, absolutely uh, not an appropriate thing to do according to the people in the mortuary. It's um, not appropriate to use a pram to transport some uh, to transport an infant to the mortuary. So at this point, the image is slightly in a, um, incorrect on the screen. Uh, the porter did have to transport the um, infant in the metal container. And then at the end of the study, the clinical care team would talk to the parents about the study, get their parents, uh, the parental insight about their um, experiences of the whole um, experience of taking part in research postmortem imaging study. Another topic was support for staff. Um, for instance, the scanning center that we uh, scan the infant in is a research scan, is a research center, sorry. Um, so not a clinical setting. So uh, in order to not make any of the other researchers in these facilities uncomfortable or uneasy, all the scanning was done outside of hours. Uh, we had to wait till after 6 p.m. and before research started the next day. So um, it was done overnight. And also this introduces a, an, another time constraint. Um, there was also on-site psychiatrists uh, with, you know, whom staff could visit if they required counselling. Um, we had the on-site charity SNAP, which is the support for sick new newborns and their parents, who are also available if uh, the staff wish to debrief or reflect on their um, interaction with the family. And the last component was um, PPI input, which is uh, patient and public involvement. Uh, this is uh, the research team worked closely with the on-site charity SNAP, who were fantastic in um, providing a lot of their kind of expertise and insight into designing the study, uh, an appropriate care pathway, making sure that the uh, all the parent-facing documentation was appropriate, and they actually provided um, a pram specifically for this. And so that is the kind of overall care pathway from beginning to end. Um, and as you can see, there's lots of ethical and uh, practical challenges that had to be addressed in setting up this feasibility study. But even um, the kind of single uh, single component of this picture here, the imaging, that this was another host of challenges. So in order to bridge the gap between the postmortem data and the in vivo DHV data set, we had to hold certain components of the acquisition parameter constant between the two to make them somewhat comparable. So the uh, diffusion preparation using spin echo and the readout using EPI were held uh, consistent. And also the number of volumes and directions were consistent between the postmortem and the in vivo data set. Um, so with these constraints in place, then it was a, we also tested multiple parameters um, in terms of B values and trying to get the spatial resolution as high as possible. In order to get high spatial resolution with reasonable SNR, this is why we're at seven Tesla. Um, but of course, using seven Tesla scanning, um, using diffusion sequences for multiple hours causes a lot of heating issues. So this causes both ethical and um, kind of uh, image issues. So the ethical issues is we do not, of course, want the tissue the infant, the body to be in any way degrading during the um, during the scanning period. Um, and also uh, we would try to hold the temperature constant so that the diffusion properties weren't fluctuating over the course of um, seven or so hours. So uh, we developed an active cooling system, which is the schematic is outlined here. And this pumps uh, water through a cooling pad and this was developed and piloted extensively using porcine uh, pig brains and we had thermometers inside and outside the pig brains and tested over multiple B values and a host of other situations. And in all instances, the temperature was kept at the kind of temperatures of the mortuary, which is approximately 10 degrees. And the active cooling system was quite successful in maintaining temperatures at 10 degrees, plus or minus, I think, one degree Celsius over the course of a seven hour scan. In addition to maintaining a consistent temperature, there was also uh, the fact that there's this is unfixed tissue at seven Tesla at low temperatures. So the um, optimum T1s and T2s and other prop tissue properties that need to go into um, optimizing the 
acquisition protocol is not really well documented at all in the literature. As a result, there was a, a need for some initial piloting. However, each we we knew that the recruitment phase was going to have really low numbers, so it was deemed inappropriate to um, dedicate an entire scan to piloting. Um, so we used one or two hours at the beginning of the first infant scan to pilot a few different uh, parameters such as B values and got them as high as possible. Uh, there's also a time constraint that even over the course of a seven hour scan, um, trying to get this spatial resolution and this many volumes meant that um, there was a limit to the spatial resolution at the resolution we achieved, which is 0.8 millimeter isotropic. The SNR was quite good, but I believe if we went to a higher spatial resolution, we wouldn't, would have actually run out of time. So those are some of the main um, kind of physics and acquisition based challenges that we had to uh, address. Um, and now I'm just going to show some of, uh, of the kind of data that were acquired. Um, so we acquired two infants worth of data, but um, they were both featured quite uh, a lot of brain pathologies and one of the infants brain had uh, such severe pathologies that it, it, we didn't actually try attempt to analyze it at this stage because it, uh, it was just registrations were failing and so on. So I'm just presenting um, N of one. This is uh, a young male uh, born extremely prematurely as in 23 weeks. Um, so a, a normal term age birth is 40 weeks gestational age. This, is, this um, male was born at 23 weeks gestational age. As you can see at a severe grade three uh, intraventricular hemorrhage on the left brain and the ventricles are quite severely dilated. Um, so this uh, this infant, this uh, neonate died at week 24 and was scanned within 18 hours of uh, death. So you can see um, some of the ultrasound scans that were taken prior to um, death and the massive amount of information that we can uh, gain from using this high, high resolution MRI to kind of better understand and interpret these um, ultrasound images. Uh, next to this is the one in vivo data set subject from the typical DHB data set. So we identified five infants that were age matched, you know, 25, 29 weeks old and presented here side by side to get a comparison for the differences in um, spatial resolution. Uh, Quite nicely, you could make out some features. I'm not sure if it's going to be visible at your end, but you can see between the kind of darker cortical plates and the underlying white matter are kind of a white uh, a hyper intensity layer, which is a, a transient zone called a subplate. And we kind of got the average intensity across one of the hemispheres, the non pathological hemisphere, and plotted the intensity as a function of depth, just going kind of at right angles to the surface. And we were able to see this little peak in T2, which um, occurred about one, milli one millimeter deep, which aligned up with this uh, superior um, subplate. So we were able to resolve this. Uh, and these purple lines here are the five individual in vivo subjects. And the purple line here is the average of those in vivo subjects. So in the in vivo subjects, in, in no cases were we able to resolve the superior subplate, um, but in the postmortem high resolution data we were. Um, we also have a lot of concern about the kind of how many, how much of these phenomena are going to be due to the death process rather than actually just uh, really it being equivalent to an in vivo subject. So to test whether this is um, an artifact or not, we sound sample. I, I, I couldn't see any of these purple lines, and I'm not sure if other people were having the same experience, so I'll just ask as, as last time. So, so at the moment, okay. I'm only seeing the left side of the screen with post-mortem in vivo, and then I could see the, the uh, uh, orange blip at about one millimeter, and then yeah. I couldn't see, uh, yeah, and then, and then I wasn't sure which purple lines you were talking about. Uh, can you see the cursor? I see your right? cursor either. I don't know if you've got your cursor and laser. Oh, you can see something. the cursor. Oh, sorry, I've been using the cursor quite a bit, so... Um... Yeah. Uh, I don't know why you can't see the cursor. I'm sorry, but and, uh, well, maybe it's only me. But uh, it, it, it was all going fine up until this point. But I thought I might as well interrupt you rather than have everyone sitting there uh, wondering. Um, yeah, um, it's not overly. I can uh, just move on to the next section anyway because yeah, it's okay. um, yeah. it's not a key key point. But the point is anyway, quantitatively, we were able to kind of 
um, demonstrate that we could resolve this. And after downsampling the high resolution image to the lower resolution image, um, this, uh, this, this little blip in intensity disappeared. Um, when fitting the DKI model to um, the data set, we've got uh, here on the right hand side, all these um, red orange scale images. On the top row is the forget-me-not high resolution data. And on the bottom row is an exemplar subject that's been age matched from the DHP data set. And again, there's a kind of a high degree of correspondence between the two, which was uh, reassuring. But also, you, as you'd expect, it's kind of better tissue contrast. So if you look at the middle column, the fractional anisotropy on the top row, this is in kind of the, the inverse of what happens in adults, where in adults you might have high fractional anisotropy in the white matter and lower in the gray matter. In infants, it's flipped due to the um, low myelination in the white matter and the kind of highly aligned um, apical dendrites in the pyramidal cells in the cortex. So you can see the really high FA values in the uh, cortical plate in the uh, forget me not data set and much better tissue contrast due to um, less um, partial volume effects. Also, you can notice the massive difference in the scaling of the diffusion diffusivities between the two data sets, which is driven primarily by um, I guess the temperature differences. We also looked at cortical radiality. So um, on the right here is a histology section of a, a human motor cortex from 28 weeks um, postmenstrual age, which highlights the kind of apical dendrites that I was uh, mentioning in the cortical plate. And on the left hand side, and in the yellow plots, we see uh, a measurement of radiality, which is just how, uh, on a scale of zero to one, how perpendicular is the primary diffusion direction to the, um, the normal surface. And in all cases, we should, would expect this radiality to be very, very high, but in the um, in vivo data sets, in areas of high curvature, these areas were had quite low radiality due to, again, partial volume effects in regions where there's um, in a high curvature. And these were better kind of resolved in the higher spatial resolution, forget me not data set. And lastly, uh, some of the diffusion tractography images. Um, these are just some of the tracks that we uh, identified using um, one of the FSL standard tools, I think it's uh, Auto PTX, which has now been replaced by Extract. And we identified close correspondence between the post mortem um, tractography results and the in vivo tractography results. Again, I'm only presenting results for um, the right hand side of uh, the, the data because the left hand side had severe pathologies which caused major uh, issues with uh, the tractography results. So some conclusions and uh, data sharing points to highlight. Um, one of the main takeaways we got from this is that it is, an, it is indeed feasible to collect high quality postmortem MRI data from unfixed tissue using sequences that are closely aligned to the in vivo DHP data set for research purposes. Um, the care pathway for this infant postmortem research study was well received by the clinical team, the research imaging center, and the, the parents participating. Um, using some very brief questionnaires at the end um, with the parents, we uh, identified that they had a very positive experience of the two parents that, two sets of parents that took part in our research, very positive experiences of it, and it, they felt like they were giving something back to um, research and uh, kind of helped give some meaning to. Um, the, the tragic event. One of the main highlights or main takeaway points is that close and effective communication was absolutely critical for any of this to occur. Um, in order to, for effective communication between the research team, the clinical team, the mortuary, we had to have uh, dedicated staff who worked on the unit who knew exactly um, the comings and goings of um, everything on the unit. In terms of data sharing, uh, we would of course, love to make this an open data set, but uh, due to ethical restrictions, as we wrote in um, our manuscript on Coronial Bioarchive, it's appropriate to monitor access and usage of the data as it's highly sensitive information. It's pretty much impossible, I guess, to make this uh, non-identifiable because given, given the low numbers of um, infant deaths, uh, simply stating that it's in the John Radcliffe Hospital that is uh, over a certain year, um, it's quite easy to identify subjects. Uh, one other point is about postponing data release. We uh, thought it might be worth postponing the data release to prevent any risk of data exposure to grieving parents. 
um, just in case these parents might be in research themselves and the last thing they need during a difficult period is to um, see the, the data set of their uh, recently deceased infant. Um, so as this is uh, all of the summary points I wanted to highlight in this um, forget me not project, as you can see, there was a lot of difficult challenges, um, but um, I think the data coming out of it is going to be really useful and um, we're hoping to get this project up and running again. It had to take a bit of a hiatus during the COVID lockdowns and um, we're slowly get, ramping it back up. So this is a massive effort from a giant team based in Oxford. And so I'd like to thank all of them and everyone here for um, listening and the event organizers for inviting me to speak. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Luke. Uh, that's really quite uh, quite something. Um, I, I, I've already got a, one question, so I'll, I'll just fire it into the sure. chat for you. Uh, I can read it out. The, the baby care pathway looks itself to be a full-scale operation. Did you have any external technical advisors on producing uh, the guidelines? We had a lot of the resources. Well, first of all, yes, it, it was definitely a full scale operation in itself. This took um, well over a year to get the paperwork up and running to get all of this done. Um, we didn't need to bring anyone external in. Uh, we have some uh, fantastic researchers in our in our um, in our own research group who are, are intimately familiar with all of the ethics paperwork and the SNAP charity is a charity that we've been working with for years we, and they've been around for a long time. So we're already fully integrated with the clinical team, the charities, the ethics boards. Um, but yes, I agree it was a full scale operation. Um, well, we've got some more questions coming up, so I'll just uh, just feed them into you as they, as they arrive. So from your neighbour, Amy. Thank you. Uh, do you have any plans to scan additional infants in the future? I appreciate that some. I am not getting the end of. Maybe I'm in the wrong section. Can I go to this chat section? Yes, I appreciate. Uh, it. it should have it should have up on screen. Uh, oh yeah, I think it cut off the end of it. So, uh, do you, did you encounter any additional difficulties because of this? So we do uh, indeed have plans to get data acquisition back up and running. Um, and in fact, we want to try and increase the range of data that we're acquiring. So. This feasibility scan included, I highlighted the T T2 scans and the diffusion data, but I think some of the uh, FIMRIP physicists were also highlighting other scans to look at relaxometry and magnetization transfer. Additionally, we want to try ideally to have histological data as well. Would, that would be, we're trying to bridge the gap between histology and um, MRI, which currently we were just doing based on you know, hypotheses derived from the literature but I, ideally we'd be all within subject. We didn't introduce histology at the initial part of this project because we thought that would be too many barriers to entry. And um, that in terms of normal uh, invasive autopsies, about 50 to 60% of parents reject the option to, for a, a normal histology due to concerns around body disfigurement. So this would be a massive uh, issue and hopefully something that imaging can help alleviate just doing Im imaging based uh, autopsies. But ideally, we would like to introduce that component as well. Uh, in terms of data acquisition over the pandemic, it, we actually stopped just prior to lockdown, um, even when we were able to acquire data. Um, say, you know, having permission from the unit from the university and so on uh, during the course of the pandemic. Um, just the willingness of parents to be involved um, kind of went through the floor, which is completely understandable. So this occurred even for our non-postmortem studies, just for our normal in vivo studies. We tried to continue acquiring data uh, throughout 2020 and 21. And I think we've had two years without collecting MRI data. Uh, we do other things in the lab, thankfully, um, but we've only begun collecting MRI data in vivo in the last month. Um, since 2019. So we've taken a bit of a hit in returns of recruitment, but hopefully we're going to get back up and running again. Um, so why, ooh, 
Why is motion an issue for prenatal baby? I thought the head was easily tight or tied. Um, so <clears throat> it's definitely not. So they, we use similar comfort measures to adults. There's no firm, nothing overly firm holding them in place. So they have a, a lot of padding around them. Um, we are highly concerned about hearing protection. This is obviously for in vivo um, scans. We have three layers of hearing protection um, and having a high amount of pressure to fix that in place would be quite an, uh, uncomfortable for the infant. So if there's any degree of tightness, the infant will um, be quite upset and the scan will not even commence. Uh, the way to try and minimize motion is completely about comfort measures. Ideally, the mother would be there um, so that we can have a feed just before going into the scan and they go into what we describe as a milk coma and it's just a feed and wrap and then they fall asleep. But if there's any sort of desire to move, they have quite a lot of wiggle room, especially in this direction, whatever that's called. Um, so head motion is a massive issue. Um, it's not fixed nearly as tightly or uh, as, as you might think. Yeah. Thanks. Do we have do we have any more questions? If not, I'd like to thank uh, Luke for a very impressive uh, talk, um, and I'd like to, ah right. Ah, oh, you uh, just when you thought you were off the hook. I was um, the way that we're beautiful. It looks to me that we do see the cortical subplate antedilated the, the HP data. Maybe the bump was at one millimeter. T2. T2. Let me go back. Um, I think you can, all, you can see it uh, maybe. Yeah. I think if you squint hard enough, you can potentially see some lamination in the in vivo data sets. Um, and to kind of try and prevent us from making stuff up and just claiming that we were seeing things that we wanted to see. This is why we did add quite a few um, quantitative components to it. So I didn't actually present a lot of the quantitative data here. I just uh, showed some pretty pictures. Um, we did try and quantify these blips and we couldn't actually see it quantitatively, but um, I agree that in some of the higher quality uh, T2 in vivo data sets, you can see quite a bit. And this was a particularly good subject, and we picked it to give it a, yeah, to give a fair comparison. They're not always beautiful, unfortunately. Thanks. Maybe that's the last question. It may be, you never know. Uh, okay, if, if I talk too long, someone will come up with another question, perhaps we'll see. Um, otherwise, Thanks again, and I'd like to also thank all the other speakers for a, a very uh, well varied and, and very informative uh, session. So, so thank you very much, uh, everyone. Uh, it's nice of you to come to the foreground so we can, uh, I don't know, wave goodbye or whatever one does at the end of this. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, yeah, um, we seem to have got back on track in time. Everything worked perfectly in the end with a slight uh, speaker rearrangement, but I suppose uh, it's part of the course. Um, Okay, um, that's it from me, and uh, thank you uh, very much, everyone, and uh, goodbye. Thank you. Bye.